plane. All right. Well, Kevin, welcome to the show. Oh, Eric, so good to be here, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm stoked to have you. I've been following you for a while. And so, yeah, wanted to get in touch and uh, hopefully provide some great insights and tools for our listeners. But just starting out, man. So where are you originally from? Yeah, so I am originally from Philadelphia. These days I live in Miami, um, but I was born and raised about 90 minutes north of Philadelphia in a town called Bethlehem, a little town of Bethlehem. And then I lived in Philadelphia for 12 years and very much it became my identity for a long time. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a Philly boy. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've never been to Philly. Love Miami though. Uh, one of my good friends years ago after we graduated high school, he moved, he's Cuban. So he actually moved out there. They got family, big community. Yeah. Um, I've, so I've been back a few times, but man, Miami is a fun place. I went maybe yeah. a couple of years ago and then we went down to Key West, which was also really cool. But uh, he kind of... Uh, that tropical vibe, huh? You get yeah, away from that cold in Philly. The warmth. <laughs> yep. Just love that it's warm year round. It's awesome. So, like, not so much growing up, but like, when you were younger, did you feel like a calling to entrepreneurship or did you have like some, were you noticing like any kind of like leadership quality or kind of explain how that came about? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what's funny is I didn't, like, I don't know. I never thought about business ownership. I don't, really think there are any business owners in my family. So like, I don't think back then I really thought I would be a business owner or not. I don't even think the word entrepreneur was used as much when I was a kid, but I totally was an entrepreneur. Like, that's the funny part. I always said that I was like a, a 50 year old man trapped <laughs> just like in a, in childhood, because I was like, I liked spending time doing entrepreneurial things. Like in sixth grade, I, I ran a pencil rental service where uh, classmates who forgot to bring a pencil could rent a pencil for a dollar per period. And I was like, started making good money. And then that got shut down. In the summer, I would I was the commissioner of a wiffle ball league. So me and my pals would, like there were 12 of us. I would like create a whole regular season schedule complete with like assigned umpires. We had playoffs. There was a website. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I made a website and like posted the homework that we had every single night, uh, which was great until... Uh, until the teachers started holding my classmates accountable to check in the website for the homework. And then my classmates didn't really like it anymore because they didn't have an excuse. So it, what's funny is, like I said, I, I just kind of did those things because I just like liked making stuff that was useful. Uh, and so eventually that, and I actually out of college went into, I was, I was a software developer at a big uh, insurance company. So like I didn't get into entrepreneurship right away. I went the nine to five path, but uh, it was very much, is very much a part of me. And so I, I did find my way to entrepreneurship. Wow, a software developer. Yeah, that seems uh, just, yeah, totally different from where you are now, which is interesting, but I'm sure there's some crossover there. Um, yeah. So was it around that time when you got the idea to get into podcasting? Because I know you started that original show, Philly, Hu Philly Who? Um, talk about yeah. that, like from software developer, what was like the impetus for that show and kind of walk us through a little bit about how that started. Yeah. So I went to college in Philadelphia. So growing up, even though I lived really close to it, I really, I don't even think I stepped foot in Philly other than the baseball stadium until I like visited Temple University. And when I got there, I was like, this is awesome. This is really cool. So I went to college there. As soon as I graduated, I immediately like my top priority when job searching was I wanted to work in downtown Philadelphia. So got that job um, and lived there for another four years after graduation. And it was late 2017. I was on the subway on the way to work in the morning. And by then I like, by then I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I had a couple of failed ventures that I kind of did as side hustles. They failed. Um, and I was in a period where I had I had done side hustles for a while and I actually was very intentionally not working on a side hustle. I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna kind of chill out for a little bit, maybe do some travel and you know, just not worry about what I'm gonna do <laughs> as an entrepreneur. Yeah. And but I was still super inspired by the stories of entrepreneurs. And so by then, like I said, 2017, the show How I Built This with Guy Raz was really, really popular. It was like two years in. Right. And I was just listening to an episode in the morning and they were doing an episode about Warby Parker, which is the glasses company. And I didn't realize it, but Warby Parker was originally founded at a college. It was uh, in Philadelphia at, at the University of Penn. So I'm listening to the show and I'm like, this is amazing. I'm so inspired by hearing the story of this really successful company and how it was founded in the streets that I walk on every single day. 
So by the time the episode ended, I was like, this was awesome. I want to hear more successful Philly stories like this in a like on a podcast, but in a way that's like a little bit more cinematic, right? It's like narrative and, and there's like music underneath and it's just so emotional. So I looked around to see if there were any other Philly podcasts like that. I was like, there's got to be one because now I realize that that's like an insanely niche proposition, but I didn't know that then. I was just like, there's got to be one of those. So I didn't find one. And then I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to make that because I had experience with audio production from my acapella days in college, which is a whole nother story. But uh, I was like, you know, I understand how to edit. I know how to, uh, I particularly know how to edit the human voice really well. Uh, and I like think I ask good questions. So I think that'd be, and it would be great to like interview these successful people. So that's what I did. I launched Philly Who, which was there to tell the stories of successful Philadelphians. And I mean, the rest was, the rest was history. And now all I do is podcast and talk about podcasts. <laughs> same, man, same. So yeah. it, what do you, what do you contribute to the success of that show? Or like what, I mean, I, I think back then, and and obviously it takes a lot of work to podcast and grow a podcast, but was a little bit of like right place, right time back then? Or what do you attribute to like that being kind of the successful show that it was and kicking off the adventure that you're currently in now? Yeah, so there's two things that I accidentally did right. Mm -hmm. The first one is that I spent a ridiculous amount of time on making a really, really good show. Like I'm talking like I would spend like 40 hours editing an episode. And and like, that was me like learning how to edit. And like, you know, eventually it took way less than that. Like those are like the first episode, I think I edited two or three times just to like get it the way I wanted it to sound. But, you know, at that point in time, I didn't, I wasn't publishing yet. Like there was no rush. Like I was just kind of spending my weekends editing these podcast episodes. And like I said, the intention was for it to be very cinematic uh, and very like heavily, heavily produced. And while I'm not saying that every podcast should be heavily produced, what I accidentally did was I put a lot, a lot of thought into the listener experience and making it so that every single minute of that episode was really, really, really good. And I edited out anything that wasn't immediately relevant. So that was the first thing is that out of the gate, like when people heard this show, it sounded like an NPR podcast and it was really good storytelling with voiceovers and everything. And people were like, what is this? This is insane. <laughs> so that's the first thing is that I like accidentally focused on making a really good product. And like I said, it was a hobby thing. So I'm not saying that everybody has to do it that way. But there are a lot of podcasters who, when they, when they design their product, when they design their show, they think about themselves first. They think about how can I do this? How much time is it going to take me to make this? How much time is it going to me, take me to do an intro? I want to like make it really efficient for me. And what that does is that makes it not the best listening experience. And, you know, there's a myriad of things that I know now but that I didn't know then. And then the second thing is that I actually marketed the show accidentally uh, in ways that actually got people who would be interested in the show to learn that it exists. And I didn't, I didn't rely on my guests to spread the word. I used social media and entrepreneur communities in Philadelphia to spread the word about it myself. Uh, and I also didn't like, you know, use, you know, think that if I put out a good show, people will just find it. Um, and again, I didn't, I didn't realize that that's what a lot of podcasters think will happen when they launch their show. So those are the two things that I completely accidentally did out of the gate. Now, shortly after the show launched, like growth stagnated after the launch buzz wore off and I had already left the corporate job and I was, you know, like the first year was not fun because I left the job. I had no income and the show wasn't growing and it wasn't being monetized. But really the unfair accidental head start that I had was accidentally doing those two things right out of the gate. Yeah. Interesting, man. Um, and I love like, yeah, your, your editing style. It is very like NPR, even on grow the show. Now the show that you host, uh, yeah, dude, great editing by the way, with the narrative and cutting in and out the music and building like tension. Definitely. Uh, something to aspire to do. Um, you mentioned social media and that's interesting because I hear like two sides of the coin. Like some people are like, well, social media people aren't necessarily podcast consumers. Uh, you got to, you know, to, to grow your podcast, you got to get on other podcasts or advertise it on podcasts or in places where podcast listeners are. What do you, what do you think about that? I mean, do you think social media, obviously you have to have social media and obviously it helps, but, um, does have because I've seen people that sometimes have like a killer social media, but then their podcast is you know they might have tens of thousands of Instagram followers, but their podcast is kind of small. How did like you equate the two, or what is there a disconnect? Yeah, so 
The reason why social media worked for me in 2018 was that I used it before everybody else was trying to use social media to grow a podcast. Like it was a novel thing. Like I would, I had a, a Instagram account for Philly Who and I would, and I don't recommend this now. Like it, I really don't recommend this now. But what I would do is I would literally, the, the, uh, the account uh, with the Philly Who account, I would go and over the course of a week, I would follow every single person that followed that week's guest. And like, so people would, it, people would like open their phone and it would say, Philly Who podcast followed you. And they'd be like, whoa, what is that? Because back then, anytime somebody followed you, you'd be like, who's this? And you'd check out their profile. And also back then there was a convention that if somebody followed you, you would follow them back, which I don't really think that's as much a part of social media culture as it is now than it was then. And the other thing that I'll say is that like on that account, I was making audiograms and I was making them the hard way. Like there were no tools, there was no headliner or descript back then. I was in Final Cut Pro spending an hour like animating like the captions and stuff like that. But at that point in time, nobody had ever seen a podcast audiogram on social media before. It was a new thing. So they, they'd have this image show up in the animation. And they'd be like, whoa. And they'd be like, you know, so it was, it had novelty. Today, what, like what you're seeing is I 100% agree with. Like there's a total disconnect. And what I, you know, preach to my clients and my listeners on the Grow the Show podcast is that the number one most efficient way to grow a podcast audience is to get more listeners where they listen, right? Get them when they're listening to other podcasts. So you totally alluded to that. And it's true. Like there's a huge, huge disconnect. It's really hard to get people to transition contexts, even if they're a passionate podcast listener. It's really hard for them to go from a moment where they see your content on social media to their listening to your podcast while they listen to podcasts. And many times there's hours or days between those two moments. So the odds that they're going to remember your show, even like it's just it's it's a really, really, really tough task. And that's why you see a lot of influencers who have huge social media followings, but can't get anyone to listen to their show. Yeah, it's so funny. Like my friends and I, we, we uh, you know, we meme, send memes to each other a lot or like uh, little snippets, mostly of like comedy shows of like the top comedy yeah. shows. And then I'll ask them, I'll be like, oh, like, did, so did you listen to the episode with Theo Vaughn or did you listen to the episode with Burt Kreischer? And, uh, and they have like no clue. They're like, they don't. That, I guess they're just Episode not podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess they're just not podcast listeners. Like, yeah, they enjoy the clips. We all enjoy the clips. Um, but it's so true. It's like getting them to, uh, you know, hop off that platform, then go to the Apple Podcast or Spotify and search for the episode. Yeah, I know you can link to stuff and stories and and things, but um, yeah, it seems like it is kind of that jump, which is it, it's interesting. Podcast clips are a great way to grow a social media account. Yeah but not a podcast, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that, it, that's always been top of mind for me as I'm like learning more and growing more in the community. Um, okay. So you're, you're, you're killing it with Philly who, how many years did you host that for? And at what point, uh, let's talk a little bit about monetization. At what point were you able to monetize that show? And you're like, Oh, so now I had quit the job and now I'm podcasting and this is awesome. You're probably pumped. You're yeah. like, dude, this is, this is great. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that summer, oh my gosh, that that summer was one of the most fun summers ever because it was before reality struck where I was like, I need to figure out how to do business. And I was just living off of savings, running around the city, interviewing incredible people. Like I felt I was I was like, I have no like, who am I to be like spending my day talking with these incredible Philadelphians? Um, but then very soon, like, yeah, I would see the savings amount go down. Uh, and I was like, uh oh, so the like the the timeline of how it worked was I left the job in July by I want to say August or September. So I didn't make any revenue until uh, I, I think it was probably around September of that year of 2018. And the first revenue was actually not directly related to Philly Who. It was uh, production work for Comcast NBC Universal. So Comcast NBC Universal is headquartered in Philadelphia. And one of their executives, their chief innovation officer, discovered Philly Who and became a huge fan and basically reached out to me and said, hey, we've got this division of Comcast that like serves entrepreneurs and they're looking to launch a podcast. Like, would you would you help them? And I was like, hell yeah. So that was like, I kind of accidentally launched an, a production agency through that engagement. And so my first, the first dollars that I made after leaving the corporate gig work was consulting work for bigger media companies. Shortly after that, I'm trying to think, the first dollar made for Philly Who was probably merchandise. Oh, so I started that's, drop that's shipping. Kind of different. Yeah. 
it is different. And I don't talk about it a lot because like, I don't want to like <laughs> encourage podcasters to think that like merchandise is how they're going to like pay for their show. That's, and yeah, like, say, that's tricky. Unless you're like a famous. It's tricky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The margins are low. Like it's really not like it's, it's good as like a marketing technique that you can make a little bit of money. Like it's a kind of free mm-hmm. marketing technique. But, um, you know, that was like the first dollar that I made from Philly who was probably a t-shirt. And then, Shortly after that, I started selling ads for the show. So I started reaching out. Now, keep in mind that a lot of my listeners were entrepreneurial folks in Philadelphia. So a lot of them had companies. And so, yeah, like a lot of my, uh, that initial revenue was sponsorships for the show. And then I got into events. So the big, big jump was in one year after launching the show, I believe it was actually the one year anniversary, I held a live uh, recording and I partnered with a local concert hall and we did this huge, huge event where we interviewed these two really famous chefs that are in Philadelphia. They like brought snacks for everybody. So like you would get, you would get a, a preview of like the new restaurant they were opening if you, with your ticket. We, ha- we did a couple follow, or no, we, there were two other past guests of Philly Who that we invited back to like be on a panel after the main interview. And we sold tickets. Well, we, I sold tickets for uh, 40 bucks for that thing. And so, I mean, I showed up, interviewed these people and left with four grand in my pocket. It was, it was awesome. Um, and that was after the 40% cut that the venue took. So like the thing did well. Uh, and then by then, you know, at that point, I had a fairly diversified revenue streams through, uh, through merch, through sponsorships, through um, conference appearances. So I did a few conference interviews where we got paid to be like a keynote and like interview somebody and live events. Uh, and I think there's another there's another stream in there that I'm forgetting, but it was super like super tons of little tiny chunks that in all added up to a six figure income. Dude, that's that's rad. The live events and uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's just smart too to like incorporate. I mean, that's kind of what a lot of podcasters are doing now, and just yeah, having all those different sources of uh, revenue, those different ideas. Were you uh, were you selling ads like on a CPM basis, or just coming up kind of with a number? He says the show is big enough because we work with a couple shows that are big enough mm-hmm. to to have advertising and it's like the CPM model through through agencies. Yeah. But I know some podcasters are able to just sell advertising, like, you know, pick a number, kind of. You know what I mean? Like the show is worth yeah, X exactly. amount. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I did. I, it, was, okay. it was more flat rate. Okay. Um, and I mean, I was doing, I want to say 125 bucks an episode per ad spot. And, you know, Companies were buying out 10, 10 to 20 slots in a row because remember the audience was so niche and it was all in one location. So my sponsors could be like pizza shops. Like one of my best sponsors was a uh, Mediterranean restaurant. It was awesome. I had, uh, I had one startup in Philly take out um, recruitment ads where they were hiring and they were like recruiting people. And they're like, the people that we want to hire are people who listen to Philly who because they're passionate about Philly and they you know tend to have like tech careers or whatever. So like I got, again, totally accidental. Like I would love to claim that I had this a part of the grand plan, but it just, you know, these types of opportunities came up and it it worked really well. Yeah, I love that. I love like the localization of it or just, yeah, kind of being like the go-to guy in Philly. I mean, you know, people talk about niching down and that, that's a, uh, you did it well, man. Thanks, man. We had festivals, we had co-working spots. Like it, it was really great. Sometimes I pined for those days because it was just so easy to sell the audience because it was so clear who it was and they were so heavily engaged. So yeah, I, super, super lucky. Yeah, no, but uh, yeah. I mean, a little bit right place, right time, but not to take anything away. Dude, I'm sure you hustled your ass off, but also, yeah. I mean, 2017, 2018, I mean, podcasts were popular, but still kind of on the upswing before it like really boomed. So I know that that, that probably helped a little bit too. Um, okay. So let's talk about segueing from that into kind of where you are now, grow the show, consulting, coaching, teaching people how to podcast, teaching them about podcasting. Um, was it like a smooth ending with Philly who, or did you just call it quits or kind of how did that segue happen? Yeah. So, uh, like pretty much everybody on planet earth, it was a forced segue thanks to COVID. (laughs) So, what happened was uh, March 2020. I was I had I had just taken a, a brief like six weeks hiatus of Philly Who, you know, put the show on break, just took some time to you know because I had I had published every single week and it's like a really really heavily produced show, so it was like a lot of work for a year and a half every single week, didn't miss a week. 
Um, so it was like 75. <laughs> it was crazy. Uh, and so I was like, all right, I'm taking a couple of weeks off. But fast forward to March 2020, I'm bringing Philly Who back. I've got like, I think my, uh, like, I want to say like 10 weeks of interviews scheduled out with some of the biggest names, like people who were like really, really dream guests uh, at the time. And also my production agency for big media companies at that point had like, I don't know, like five or six clients. We were working with iHeartRadio. We were working with um, Tom Brady's media company, Comcast, NBC Universal. There were several other really, really cool projects. But the thing is, I hated that work. Like, it was it's a grind, cool. man. Yeah, oh, that's what gosh, a lot like, of what I do. Uh, it's it's a love hate. It's it's a lot of work, and it's a lot. Yeah, I, I feel you. <laughs> yeah, and and it was like, but believe me, like and the clients that I worked with, I'm still like the people that I worked with through those engagements are still some of my closest friends ever. But like, just doing you know, doing consulting work like that for big media companies is a slog. Like, there's challenges. It's it's just really tough. A lot of bureaucracy um, in the within the companies of, and stuff. Yeah, right. And like, also, you know, I had to like work really hard to differentiate because and I'm sure you deal with this. Like, because a lot of times a service like that starts to get commoditized. So you know, I'm like, hey, like I can help you with your storytelling. I can help you with all these different things. So uh, believe me, it was lucrative work. For the most part, it did well. I also like was so inexperienced as an entrepreneur. I didn't, I like at that point, I had a full-time employee. I didn't know the first thing about like the proper accounting, like, oh my gosh, marketing sales. It was brutal. So I was really struggling with it. And also like, I just kind of didn't love the vision of where I was heading with that. Cause I was like, all right, I guess I'll just make this kind of Gimlet style. This was right in the heyday of like Gimlet and those big, like heavily produced show companies getting bought up by Spotify. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'll make one of those shows, one of those companies that makes like shows and then maybe sell it to Spotify at some point. And then I don't know, maybe I'll have a lot of money. I don't know. So, but I wasn't too bought into the vision of it. But then of course COVID happens and overnight, all but one of my contracts evaporated. They were like, Tom Brady's media company was like, yeah, our biggest partner, uh, most of their revenue comes from March Madness and that just got canceled. So we have to cancel everything. Like it's just the ripple effects were insane. And also- Every single guest that I had scheduled for the next eight weeks canceled because they were then having to lead their organizations through this crisis that was going on. And it just felt like a weird time to spend an hour being all retrospective about your success. You know, so Philly Who had to, was just forced to go on hold. All of my contracts except one evaporated. The one that stayed, Comcast, NBC Universal, they doubled their order because everybody was at home. So they're like, well, I guess we'll just do more of this podcast thing. And that alone basically bought me enough space money-wise where they're like, all right, we're going to pay you double now. And I'm like, all right, well, I have no more expenses. So literally just for two months, like I'm, I'm sure everybody's got their quarantine story, but like two, three months, I was just, it wasn't a lot of work, but I was making enough money to cover my expenses. So I was just like, all right, I guess I'll just kind of hang out and play Animal Crossing. So... Through that time period, though, is when I started thinking, like, what is next for me? Like, what am I going to do in, with this thing? And I just actually started setting up conversations with other podcasters that I knew. And it, what's funny is that I thought I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a brand. I'm going to create a podcast and a blog and a website and maybe even a course about how to be a great interviewer. Like, I was like, that's what the thing is going to be. It's going to be about how to be a great interviewer because... In my head at the time, I was like, that's what every podcaster wants to do. And then I had a mentor say, okay, that might be true. Like you might be right, but do me a favor. Go and talk to 30 podcasters and don't ask them if they would buy a course on interviewing. Just ask them what they're struggling with, what they need help with and what they're not sure about. And I was like, okay, whatever. Uh, you know, I'm like, I know what they need, but okay, I'll, I'll hear you out. Sure enough. 30 out of 30 podcasters that I spoke to, some worked for startups, some were independent, some were like big media, across the board, all 30. Not one, they all said, my content in interviewing is great. I know I don't need help with that. What I really need help with is how do I get more listeners and how do I monetize? And I'm like, okay, so thank God I didn't make a course about interviewing because clearly that's not the, 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 the pain, the pressing need that everybody has. And my mentor was like, you're probably right. They probably do need to get better at their content, but that's probably not something that they're going to pay for right now. So what you can do is give them what they want and need, but also like pill the dog and give them a little bit, uh, you know, put the pill in the peanut butter and give them a little bit of what they need while also giving them what they want and need. 
Sure enough. So I was like, by the 30th conversation, I was like, boy, I guess these podcasters really need help with growth and monetization. And up until that moment, I didn't realize that I had done that so well. Because like I said, it was all accidental. I was just going by the seat of my pants. And as I spoke one-on-one -on -one with all these podcasters, I was like, wow, I guess I, I guess my show is like way more successful than I realized it was. So that's when I was like, well, maybe people need help to grow the show. <laughs> and that's when I was like, all right, that's what I'm going to do next. And that's all I've been doing for three years. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, just it is kind of like a natural fit and you had that experience and you segued you're like this is this is and that kind of is what people need. I mean, we I get a lot of requests for uh you know, our show's doing okay, but we we want to get more downloads. We need to get more listeners. We want to grow, we want to monetize and you know, if you have the audio down and the content down, that really is uh that really is the next piece of the puzzle that can kind of determine your long-term success, but uh Speaking of, yeah, speaking of growing the show, give us, what what do people get wrong about growing the show? Like what, so in your experience, like what you see, uh, what are most people getting wrong about not, and they're not growing? Yeah, so there's two two issues. Uh, and you'll, you'll hear them echo what I talked about when I talked about what I accidentally did right with, with Philly Who. And I'll start with a content piece because... Every podcaster thinks, my content's great. We're having great conversations. It's super interesting. I know that's not the problem, right? Well, it is great, but it could be better. Like, it's good. It could always but be it better. it could be great. Yeah. And it, it, yes. And, and like, most people's content is good. Very few podcasters' pod content is great. Truly great. And there's really two ingredients to that, in my opinion. You know, after working with 400 plus podcasters in my program and thousands more like in my opinion the first place to start is by having a unique premise right here is what this podcast is and a lot of people their podcast looks exactly the same as four billion other podcasts so the number one the question is why would i listen to this when it sounds exactly the same as joe rogan or tim ferris or my favorite murder or another show that like is so established and experienced and has a crazy budget. Like if you're trying to do the same thing as them, people you are competing with them. Like people are going to choose between listening to you and listening to the 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 best in the world. So to start, what I recommend is make it number one. Make your show find the angle that makes your show truly unique. It puts your show in what I call a category of one. Find a cat one category of one premise to, that says. This podcast is the only podcast that has this combination of three things, who the show is for, what it does for those people specifically, and how it does it for those people specifically. Find a combination of those three things that's completely unique, and you'll be off to a good start. Another, yet another podcast about success, about entrepreneurship, <laughs> yeah. sharing stories, right. like yeah. You've got enough of those, right? You've seen, you have to have seen a million of those oh, already, right? Oh, no, of course. I mean, that's what everyone, yeah, they just want to talk to like the CEO of the startup of the blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and that's cool and all, but um, yeah, I like how you're saying you got to, you got to narrow it down and you got to, someone's got to get something from, aside from a great story that that's part of it, but like learn something or solve whatever problem or thing that they're trying to do. Right. And again, like we as podcasters, because we're human beings with human being brains, we think about ourselves first. So how can I make it so that I can produce this with as little effort and time as possible? Not how can I make the best 30 minutes that my podcast listener hears in during their week when really it should be how can I make that while making it as efficient as possible to make the best 30 minutes? The other thing that everyone says is I, I just want to I want to have conversations with amazing people with a wide variety of people. So a lot of podcasters like like, yes, you should know your true motivations for it and lean into it. Heck yeah, right? But if all you're doing is thinking, how can I have these incredible conversations? N nobody cares, right? <laughs> like nobody wants to hear you talking to that CEO. What is it? What is, what is it going to give them? What is it going to do for them? So the premise is the first part. And then the second half of the content piece is retention. So in my opinion, the the podcasters that have Podcasters oftentimes have more of a retention problem than they have a gro growth problem. So before we figure out how we can get more listeners, we first must think, how can we keep listeners? And there's two, like, really what, what I see happening is a podcaster will be like, you know, my podcast audience is, uh, is stagnant, right? It, every single episode I publish gets 200 downloads, 
And it's the same, you know, I, I don't know why, but I can't grow the audience. Uh, and I'm doing this and I'm doing that to grow, but the numbers won't go up. And what I say is, I have news for you. What you're doing to grow your podcast is probably working. The thing is, you get 200 people to listen to your show every week, but it's not the same 200 people because your podcast growth strategy might get you 100 new podcasters every single week, but because your podcast doesn't do a good job of keeping listeners, you lose 100 listeners every single week. So while it looks like it's a stagnant audience and it's the same people, it's actually not. So the three places to look for that are just totally tactically, if you're down, do you mind if I like share a couple Oh, tactics? I love that. Perfect. Yeah, that's, what, okay, I, that's cool. what I wanted. Awesome. So the, the, the three places to look are, number one, your intro. The first 90 seconds of every podcast episode, it has one job, and that is to sell the listener on why listening to the rest of this podcast episode is the best decision they're going to make today. What are they going to get out of it? Not what are you going to talk about, not what is it going to be, but what are they going to get by listening, right? So that's number one. You, you want to hook them there. Then when you do that, you're going to be posing a specific question that ideally your podcast episode will answer. Right, so when you're telling them what you're gonna get, you're gonna say like today, here's what we're gonna explore. Here's what we're gonna talk about. And that's gonna you know, give them something that they're gonna wanna know the answer to. So it's gonna pose a specific question. So as the episode goes on, you wanna make sure that every single piece of content that you're publishing is there to answer that question. If your show digresses too much about random things, and especially if the beginning of the conversation starts with something irrelevant to the reason why they're there, you're gonna lose the listener. Right. And they're just like, why are we talking about this? I'm not interested in crypto. I came here to learn about how to get a job. Right. <laughs> so the third place is in your feed. And the other thing that I see, which is can be a little bit harder to detect, is when a podcaster who wants to talk about a wide variety of topics, I want to talk about whatever I want to talk about. Well, you can do that, but you got to be careful because if you don't talk about things that your listeners want to hear about, they're, you're going to lose them. So the rule of thumb that I recommend is make it so that every single listener of your podcast is going to be in, insanely interested in, in every one out of three episodes. So every one out of three episodes of your show is going to be insanely relevant, minimum, minimum. Ideally, it's three out of three, but minimum three out of one out of every three episodes should be extremely relevant to the person that's listening. Once you get past three, they're like, ah, why am I subscribed to this? I'm not interested in any of this. And they leave and they never come back, right? So I know that was a lot, but like those are the pieces that I look to whenever helping a podcaster first before we even talk about growth strategy because without specificity of what the show is going to do for the listener and without, you know, keeping their attention, your growth strategy doesn't matter. You can have the best growth strategy in the world, but it, it's not going to do anything for you. Do you think that episode length has anything to do with retention? Because I was like, oh, I forget what I was listening to and they were trying to like hack like the... Uh the system where it's like shorter episodes, people are more likely to listen all the way through. And then that can help. And I don't know how much of this is true, but that, that can help your ranking because your retention is high. And I, what, do you think there's any merit in that? It, yeah. So it, I don't know if it helps your ranking, if retention rate helps your ranking specifically. Um, and, and it might, but what I know is that it is true. Like a shorter episode, you're going to have a higher retention rate. Um, like I think like I, I'm of the opinion, like I'm not trying, like it's, it's valuable to be ranked, sure, but like to me, that's gravy. Like that's 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 not a goal. goal it's like a of. result of hitting the goal. Yeah. yeah, it's like you will be ranked when you grow your show the right way. But let's focus on doing that, and the rank ranking will be a result, not a target. So, but like, what I also know is that I, Alex Armozi says, you know, there there's no such thing as too long, only too boring, and I think that is so true. That's why some of the biggest podcasters in the world can get away with publishing three hour episodes and they still have a huge show because like that, those episodes are that interesting. Um, so that's the, the number one rule of thumb is like, there's no like perfect, perfect amount of time. Like there's no such thing as too long, but it's really hard to make an hour plus conversation, not too boring at some point. Like it's really hard to make it so that that whole thing, because as soon as people are bored, they leave. The other point that I'll say about length is on the flip side, you do want to keep in mind that podcasting is a companion medium. So people are listening to your podcast while they're doing other stuff. And in general, those other stuffs take about a half hour, right? They're commuting, they're working out, they might be cleaning their apartment or just something. It's, you know, they're doing something else with their eyes and their hands. And so you might have the most interesting podcast in the world, but if that thing is done, 
like if they get to work, they're not going to be late for meetings because your episode was so good, right? So like they're going to leave and that's going to look like a 50% retention, even though they like come back later and listen to the rest of it. So it's just a little nuance of the, of the media to keep in mind. Um, and that's why like my rule of thumb is I do shoot for episodes to be around the 25 to 30 minute mark, but I'm not against longer episodes if they're not too boring. Right. The content. Yeah. As long as the content's good, the length could vary. You just, yeah, you don't want people to fall off. Um, and I heard you talk, this is something I wanted to talk about. Cause I've also, I, I saw you talk about it in a social media post and then, um, there's a show I listen to called Podcasting Business School, and he's mentioned it too. And uh, we're ta- want to talk about discoverability here. The name of your podcast and um, how big? Because I've been thinking about that a lot, and, and maybe even I don't know in the future, maybe rebranding the name. But how? How? Where does that factor into your strategy? The name of your podcast and how that might help people discover you if they're typing in search terms, or where, let's get some thoughts on that. When it comes to podcast SEO, so we're talking not web SEO, we're not talking like search engine optimization, we're talking like podcast app search optimization. The title is going to be one of the biggest factors. The title of your show is gonna be one of the biggest factors in whether you get SEO reach. But what's also a really important factor is how big your show is. So, you know, SEO is kind of like, you know, it's kind of like investing where the people who have all the money are the ones who get the best investment opportunities. It's the same thing where when it comes to SEO, the biggest, most established podcasts get the most SEO benefits. So that's not to say that you can't get solid SEO benefits. And I talk every once in a while, I'll talk with a podcaster who has a show who's just got, who sometimes intentionally, many times not, has just the most perfect SEO optimized podcast name and their show's growing and they don't know why. They're like, I don't know what's going on. It's just working. And I'm looking, I'm like, oh, you're getting SEO, right? Which which is great because I'm like, this is great. You got this, you know, traffic source. Let's fix all this other stuff and it's going to grow even faster. But um, I don't really recommend, like, I don't know. I'm on the fence about whether to recommend somebody name their show with SEO in mind. I like to name it with humans in mind. And they're kind of like, when you do that, you, you still oftentimes get SEO benefits. So my take on naming your show is you should make your show as self-explanatory as it can possibly be, where somebody looks at the title of your show and you don't need a description, right? It's just self-explanatory. Like, grow the show is gonna help you grow the show, right? Now, yes, I have to specify that it's podcast, a podcast show, but still, like, it, the name of the title does a lot of the work for me. What I see all the time is when somebody has, like, a really artistic or, like, a really, like, you know, I don't mean to poo poo, but like a really cute name where it's like, oh, well, here's this like really cool, creative thing that it means. That's awesome and like cool. But the problem is the person who discovers that, who, who, where you're not there to explain to them how cool of a creative name that is, they're not going to make the connection. And they're just like, I don't know what that is. And they leave. Like you just don't have as much time as you think. Right. So when it comes to naming your show, I recommend make it self-explanatory, resist the urge to be cute about it and just make it like, this is what the show is and people should be able to read it and be like, oh, okay, I get that. That's just, your show is going to grow so much faster because there's just so much less friction. And again, a lot of times a name that is like that will also be something that somebody is searching for as well. So you'll also get some tertiary SEO benefits. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking too. Yeah, you know, I see people sometimes where like tech companies or they do this all the time, but uh, yeah, they'll spell the word with like a different letter or make the spelling different. And I'm like, yeah, for podcasting, yeah, def. I don't recommend that because it, it's just not going to help anybody find you. Um, but speaking of, yeah, like discoverability, let's touch, just we'll touch on SEO real quick. Um, get your thoughts on like well-written show notes and or transcriptions. Does that help? Does it not help? Obviously, it helps a little bit. But like, where do you stand when you coach people? Do you recommend putting a lot of time into that or not? So specifically you want to talk about the functionality of show notes or just like how they relate to seo how they relate to seo like do you think that that helps people grow the show do people even read them in your experience does it help in google searches so in my experience people only read the show notes when you tell them to on the episode when you say hey the link is in the show notes or check out the show notes for xyz Uh, a very small percentage of podcast listeners in my experience uh, I, i grant you i don't have data behind this it's a little bit more anecdotal but uh, actually like just look at the show notes just to see what's there. Like it's just, they just don't do that, right? Right, right. On the SEO side, it's funny because I have pretty, like I've pretty strongly spoken out against podcasters 
you know, worrying about web SEO because two reasons. One, what I said before, which is if somebody is searching Google for something, they're looking for an answer right now. Mm -hmm. Like they want an answer to something. They don't want to have to go walk around the block and listen to 45 minutes to a podcast to get the answer to that question, right? And even if, so, so that's number one is that like, that's not, people aren't searching for podcasts for the most part. Like they're not, that's not how they want. It's a transactional thing. The quicker they can get the information, the better when it comes to SEO. But the other thing is, even if they were and they like find your show and it's like, like I said before about social media and it's perfect. Again, they're searching Google. They're not listening to podcasts. So mm -hmm. the odds that they like, oh, this is cool. Let me go listen to this 45 minute thing <laughs> right now is so low. Yeah, and even yeah. if they are interested in it, that the ads that they, the odds that they like pull up their podcasts, Apple podcasts and search your show and hit subscribe. And then tomorrow when they listen to podcasts in the morning, like remember to listen to your episode instead of Joe Rogan, like it's just the odds are stacked against not you. Not happening. So yeah. that, no. And that's the first reason why. And then the second reason why, and it's funny because whenever I say to podcasters, don't worry about web SEO, I always get attacked by people who have experience in SEO, people who are SEO professionals or own SEO agencies who are like, my podcast grew because of SEO. You shouldn't say that. It's not, it's super important. I'm like, guys, you get it. And I'm like, not put, like, great. Use it. It's if a tool that's that you know how to use. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm not saying that you shouldn't use SEO. What I'm saying is that the average podcaster doesn't know, is not technical and doesn't know the first thing about SEO. And they're not going to do WordPress plugins. They're not going to understand page rank and page speed. And like, they're just, it's just not something that they need to worry about. They would be just much much better off focusing on getting their podcast featured on other podcast feeds. Like that's it. So that's why I'm like, I just like, I'm like, just forget about web SEO. It'll work for you. Like as you go, like, yes, you'll get backlinks. Like all these things are true. But for a podcaster that's looking to learn how to grow their show regularly and reliably, I say, just forget about it for now. Yeah, because that's like one more thing you have to learn. You're already stressed out. Yeah, that's, that's a whole other uh, can of worms to open with the SEO thing. So I like that. That make, makes sense in my brain. Cool, Kevin. Yeah, it was good chatting with you, man. Um, people can find you, grow the show, grow the show.com. Is that correct? Yeah, the, literally the Grow the Show podcast or the YouTube channel is the best place to go. Or if you want to interact with me directly, you can just DM me on Instagram or on Twitter. And I'm happy to you know interact there. Uh, at Kevin Schmidlin, although it should probably be at Grow the Show. That'd be way easier to remember. <laughs> all good. Yeah, we will uh, we'll link to all that and appreciate you coming on, man. Appreciate you uh, sharing some actionable tips because I think that's important. That's what I'm trying to do with this show is, uh, yeah, educate, educate, educate and give those resources and those points of view. So thank you for coming on. Dude, it's a great resource, man. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of it. Thanks so much for having me, Art.